Microphone check. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hello. Sounds good. All right, I think we're ready to start. Hi all, welcome to Speed Science 2023. Thank you very much for joining. This event is hosted by Phyto Sigma, the Honor Society of Food Science and Technology, University of Minnesota chapter. So here is the agenda of tonight. First, we are going to introduce Phyto Sigma, our amazing organization, and also our board members. Then we will thank our sponsors and judges. Next, we'll start the presentations. And between each presentation, we'll have trivia time, and you can win prizes. Finally, of course, we we'll announce the winners. So why are we unique? We have lots of collaboration with many universities, include UMN, UC Davis, SDSU, UW Medicine, ISU, UNL, UGA, and NDSU. There are also leadership opportunities in other organizations outside of Phyto Sigma, including IFT, ADSA, ASABE, and COFE. We also have many student scholarships opportunities of participating in competitions, and also lots of award opportunities. Students at our chapter received the Student Achievement Scholarship from 2020 to 2023. In 2019, we had students win the Dr. Guy Livingston Scholarship. Also in 2022 and 2023, our students got Dr. Derry B. and Mrs. Dong Air Lang Student International Scholarship. And as a chapter, we are the outstanding chapter of the year 2014, 2021, and 2022. And chapter of excellence from 2019 to 2022. In addition to all these achievements, we also have many membership benefits in the national level for all members. Students can apply for exclusive awards and scholarships. There are also lots of leadership, networking, and membership opportunities, and you get chances competing with peers and sharing research. You also get the opportunity of posting articles in the national newsletter. And for graduation, you will receive honor cards and pins. If you would like to become a member or have any questions, feel free to contact us as, at this email. You can also find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and by this QR code. Yeah, welcome to connect with us. Now I would like to introduce our officer team for this year. Our president, Priyanshi, Vice President, Ellie, Co-Chair, Leslie. I am Xiaohan, the secretary. Our treasurer, Nigel, and Dr. Mary is the organization advisor. We also got two chapter liaisons, Amanda from North Dakota State University and Mohammed from South Dakota State University. Now, let the speedy science competition begin. First, we are very appreciate our sponsors who made this competition happen, including the gold sponsors, MNIFT, and National Phyto Sigma, and the silver sponsor, Puris. Then also a big thank you to our judges 
Dr. Lauren Jackson from FDA, Dr. Anand Rao from Agroper, one of the best in dairy products, and Myson Lu from Turis, which is very innovative in the area of plant-based protein. Thank you for all the work you have done. We really appreciate it. So for the best practices, audience, please keep yourselves muted during presentations. For Q&A session, we'll let the judges ask questions first. Once they've finished, others feel free to unmute yourselves or type in your questions in the chat. If we run out of time, you could also send the questions to us or the presenters. We'll answer back to you later. We would really appreciate it if you could show support for your peers and for presenters. Please make sure your video and audio are on. So once again, the overview of this event, three minute presentation, followed by a short Q&A session, then trivia where the judges are scoring. Then we have the next presentation after the trivia. Now, I would like to introduce our first presenter, Anto, who is a second year PhD in serious science at North Dakota State University. His topic is hemp protein isolate, gum arabic complex coacervation for enhancing stability and bioaccessibility of cannabidiol. So Anto, would you like to share your screen now? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Can you go into full screen mode, please? Presentation mode? Yeah, sure. So we can use the pointer, right? Yeah. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, currently there is a requirement for food ingredients with enhanced bioactivities. Cannabidiol, known as CBD, is a bioactive compound in industrial hemp. It exhibits excellent anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory properties. Also, it could treat neurological problems and anxiety. Due to these health benefits, currently there are several CBD products available in the market. However, its application as a food ingredient is limited due to two challenges. Firstly, its poor bioaccessibility, which is only the fraction of consumed CBD will reach the small intestine due to its poor enzyme stability. Secondly, it exhibits poor st stability in presence of heat and light. In my research, I'm aiming to improve the bioaccessibility and stability of CBD using hemp protein isolate and gum arabic complex preservatives. I discovered that hemp protein and gum arabic can interact electrostatically at pH 3.5 and form complexes. Within these complexes, I encapsulated the CBD and studied their morphological properties, bioaccessibility using in vitro digestion test and stability using HPLC. Guess what? The complexes formed a rough surface surrounding the CBD and acted as a barrier and protected them from digestive enzyme, heat, and light. The bioaccessibility of encapsulated CBD increased to 63%, which is 63% of the CBD has been successfully delivered to the small intestine without getting degraded, while the unencapsulated CBD, it showed just 30% bioaccessibility. The results indicated that our complex could act as a tiny spaceships, which can give a safe ride to CBD through the digestive enzyme. Additionally, the stability of CBD was increased by the complex preservatives at 37 degrees Celsius and 25 degrees Celsius, both in presence and absence of light. We can see here from the diagram that the unstable lady being experienced by the unencapsulated CBD. In future, we'll be using emulsion-based delivery system and hydrogel-based delivery system to encapsulate CBD. 
through this project, we have solved both the issues which are hindering the application of CBD in the food industry. Our research will be helpful to expand the application of CBD as an ingredient in food industry. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Now, so we are moving on to questions. Do any of our judges have any questions? Yes, I to a quick. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Lauren. I think I should raise. We should raise our hands. Yes, I guess. that would be helpful. Yes, go ahead. You can go first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my, my question, Anto, is fairly simple. Uh, you talked about the reaction happening at a pH 3.5. Yeah. Um, is the CBD going to maintain its activity at that pH or is it going to fall apart? Yeah, thank you for asking this question. Yeah, CBD is maintaining its functionality at this point where we are just altering the pH at which the protein and the polysaccharide, which is the hemp protein and the gum arabic, they will come to a neutral charge and we are just encapsulating the CBD. And the functionalities of the CBD, because we checked with uh, HPLC data and uh, it has maintained the original structure and it is not being degraded. So we can make it sure that 3.5, it's a really good condition for CBD. Yeah. So the, the capsule reaction is at 3.5. After the reaction, is it being neutralized before you, you incorporate CBD into it, or is it still at C3.5? Um, it's the, still at 3.5. Okay. Yeah, it's still at 3.5. We'll just prepare the emulsions, and uh, we'll for, through the emulsion, we'll adjust the pH to the point where it can form complex preservates. And within that complexes, we are just encapsulating and spray drying it. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have just one question for you. So ultimately, I guess the encapsulated mm -hmm. uh, compound is going to be incorporated into foods. Mm -hmm. um, do you anticipate um, these capsules having, you know, you know, some textural proper properties that would, you know, prevent somebody from eating, um, or you know, negative? Yeah. You know, have, have you have you incorporated into any food at, at this point? So. Thank you for asking this question. At this point, we have not yet incorporated, but uh, at the end of my PhD, I'll be incorporating inside the bakery products. So from the surface morphology, you can find that it has a smooth surface structure, but a little bit roughness, and it's not kind of a sharp peaks. So texture-wise, it should be soft, and uh, we will usually use in it in a very little concentration. So I think it should not make any changes in the texture profile. Additionally, Hemp protein and uh, gum arabic are being commonly used in the food industry as an ingredient. And uh, in recent years, hemp protein is, has gained a lot of attention. So since already several companies have used, that also serves as an indicator that it, it does not affect the texture properties to that extent, in a bad extent. But it might have a good reflection based on like functionality such as emulsification property, foaming capacity, something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Myson. Uh, so Hi, my Mason. question will be more on the uh, kind of the scaling up. So uh, you guys, you uh, created an emulsion. I'm assuming it was spray dried. Do you see yeah. any uh, issues in like scaling it up to use what you know what you found into commercial feasibility? Uh, oh, thank you for this question. So in spray drying, I did not found any issue. But uh, the only challenge we can, what I can say when you scale up is that the reduced number of amount of yield. The yield was around like 45 percentage. Probably that would be a challenge when we consider as a big scale. If we could increase the yield, then it will be a good one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can, can you expand on that point of a 45 percent yield? Is that because of the pilot scale dryer you had high losses or is there something inherent with the process that is causing the significant losses? So the yield is not totally dependent upon the spray drying, but about the complex preservatives itself. So if I am preparing the protein 
polysaccharide emulsion and from that i get like around 50 percentage yield of complex conservatives and if i spray dry it the yield will reduce that's the problem so basically if we are able to increase the yield of the complex conservatives then consequently we can increase the yield during spray drying because during spray drying i'm just removing the water just drying it yep let that answer the question yes thank you yep, thank you Any other questions? All right. Any other audience have questions? Okay, great. Thank you, Otto. Thank you. Great, great presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Now we are moving to trivia time. Ellie, would you like to take it over? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Ali, Vice President of Phi Tau Sigma. So right now I'm sending in the link to Kahoot as well as the game code. So I'll share my screen right now. Um, I hope you're all excited for this game of Kahoot. I know I am. And just a note before we start, I'll only be running a few through a few questions per round between each presenter. So if you're unable to join the first round, don't worry. I'll keep sending the Kahoot code in the chat. So you can join as we go, um, but if you're able, please join now so we can get started with our first two questions. So I'll give it a few seconds for people to join. Okay, let's get started with our first question. And again, don't worry if you're unable to join right now, we'll continue the game later on. So our first question, what company launched a sugar substitute made from the stevia plant? Is it gonna be Kellogg, ADM, Monsanto or Cargill? And a little hint, this company's headquarters is located here in the Twin Cities area. Yes, so that's indeed gonna be Cargill who debuted this technology only in 2019. So personally, this does not seem too long ago for me, considering the amount of integration we see for uh, reduced sugar applications in food today. Here's our current leaderboard. Oreo is in the lead. Let's head to our next question. Which of these is found in abundance in bananas? Is it gonna be zinc, potassium, acetine, or strodium? Yes, yeah, so potassium is going to be in abundance in bananas. Uh, within one banana, there's an average of 450 milligrams. That is roughly 13% of an adult's recommended daily value. That being said, who wants to eat seven and a half bananas to reach their potassium daily level? And then with that, we will pause trivia for now so we can give the next presenter time to present their research. Thank you, Ali. Now, All right. So now we're moving moving to the next presenters, Baswati. She is a master student in dairy science at South Dakota State University. 
and her topic is Hey, Listeria, be wary of the company you keep. Baswati, would you like to start? Yep, sure. Can everyone view my presentation? Yes. Six years ago in 2017, a listeriosis outbreak in South Africa shook the whole world. Over 200 people died, among which many were the young and the unborn who will never get to turn six. The disease listeriosis is caused by the bad or pathogenic bacteria, listeria monocytogenes. People at high risk from this disease include pregnant women, newborn babies, elderly above 65 years, and immunocompromised individuals. In the United States, the previous year alone, there were a total of five listeriosis outbreaks, out of which three were linked with dairy products. Hence, it is very much necessary to control the presence of this bacteria within the dairy industry. However, listeria can be found everywhere in the environment. Hence, it can easily trespass within the dairy industries. And inside the dairy industries, there would be other environmental bacteria accompanying listeria. These environmental bacteria and listeria can communicate with one another through small molecules and tell each other to secrete a thick, sticky substance called biofilm. The phrase, two heads are better than one, fits well in this situation. For instance, the thick biofilms of listeria can grow even thicker with the help of the environmental bacteria. Sanitizers have a hard time penetrating through the biofilm layer, so the listeria inside is only exposed to low are non-lethal concentrations of sanitizers. And over time, since practice makes us perfect, even listeria gains resistance to those sanitizers and can persist within the dairy industries for a long duration. This poses a high risk for product cross-contamination by listeria. However, we can lower the risk of cross-contamination by understanding the association between the environmental bacteria and listeria. For this purpose, I collected environmental bacteria samples from uh, and uh, from a dairy plant in United States and grew each of those environmental bacteria individually with listeria and observed listeria's growth and survivability. What I observed is that listeria can grow and survive in the presence of the most of the environmental bacteria. Hence, it is a part of the community. Going forward, the objective is that to target the molecules through which listeria and this environmental bacteria communicate with one another in hopes of lowering the biofilm formation by listeria so that sanitizers can easily access listeria and kill them and eventually stop the outbreaks of listeriosis. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Baswati. Do any of our audience have questions? Judges? Yeah, I see Dr. Yeah. Rao. Yes, yeah, so I have a quick question, Baswati. So environmental bacteria, you talk uh, as a generic bacterial species, uh, and they tend to vary from cheese plant to cheese plant or different dairy plants or different manufacturing plants. Listeria commonly associated with dairy, but it can also be found in non-dairy foods. So does this do the species the various species of environmental bacteria that are found in different plants how do they impact uh, listeria's ability to form biofilm um so far we have only uh, conducted research with ice cream plants so um and it is just one plant that uh, we have been procuring samples from and uh, as i said for future research like uh, we have already drafted a proposal for taking this research further. But for at this stage, we have just looked at an ice cream plant and we looked at areas where listeria could be found and where listeria could not be found. So we were hypothesizing that maybe uh, in areas where listeria is not there, 
the environmental bacteria is actually hampering uh, listeria's uh, growth. But what we found that uh, listeria could actually easily survive and grow in the presence of all those bacteria, as I mentioned. So, but there was one bacteria from the positive side, which is a bacillus uh, species. And we are hoping to extract the um, uh, like metabolites from that bacteria and formulate a biosanitizer and target the uh, like uh, listeria. Beyond beyond bacillus, uh, did you find any commonality in the various sampling sites of this ice cream plant? Yes, a lot of commonality. Like there were a lot of pseudomonas, uh, arum, um, then hafnia. So these kind of species were the predominant ones. So if, if your theory is that these these bacteria are helping listeria species grow um, much more tolerant biofilm, would cleaning practices that lead to removal of the these environmental bacteria or reduction of the environmental bacterial load, will that help in reducing uh, or increasing the susceptibility of listeria to, to sanitizers? Yes, that's a very good question. So um, another part of my research object, objective actually looks at uh, the cleaning protocols that's usually, usually used in dairy industries and mimics it on floor coupons. And we look at if listeria can still survive even after those cleaning protocols. What we observe that uh, as per the EPA regulations, Yes, it does lower the um, biofilm counts to uh, like lower than three logs. However, there are still survivor cells. So we are hoping that maybe by targeting the um, crosstalk, that is the um, like quorum uh, sensing between these environmental bacteria and listeria monocytogenes, we can stop biofilm formation. And that way, the cleaning protocols would be more efficient. Very good. Thank you, Baswati. Thank you. Uh, I guess I'll go next. My question is, you know, from your findings so far, even though it's just from one site, what would you recommend a company to uh, keep a lookout for in terms of potential biofilm forming in Mysteria? Like, yeah. How would you, how would a company find it if they were to look for it? Okay, uh, so as I understood your question, um, first of all, thank you for the question. So what I understood from it is like, what should company look for uh, insights to identify biofilms? Yes, sure. Uh, well, I guess, what would you recommend to be wary of listeria? It's like, hey, you should be aware of this. How would you inform that just kind of concisely? Listeria, like biofilm formation, is usually associated with uh, like wetter environment where the like cracks and crevices where there could be nutrients uh, like in abundance for the bacteria, and also it can uh, grow in colder environments. So from my uh, cleaning studies, what I uh, understood is that even at temperatures up to seven degrees Celsius, Listeria can form as robust biofilms as in 22 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, uh, so industry should keep out uh, and look for areas where there are pooling of water and should remove them. Perfect, thank you very much. I just have a quick question. Um, I'm not a microbiologist, but from what I understand is that the trend right now is to understand, you know, is are there bacteria in the background that could predict when there will be a listeria outbreak? Um, do you know of any, you know, predictor um, organisms that, you know, are like proceed, you know, something you know, from Listeria from taking play, you know, um, setting up shop? Thank you for your question. So um, as I could see from this trial that this and bac environmental bacteria actually supported Listeria's growth apart from one bacteria, which I collected from area within the dairy plant where 
listeria is usually identified so uh, what we concluded from this trial is that listeria is a part of the community however uh, it is uh, like there can be some organisms like uh, i stated uh, bacillus species that actually inhibits listeria's growth and there could be other uh, listeria species like listeria welshimeri that produces a compound uh, called N-acetyl glucosamine that uh, inhibits listeria's ability to form biofilm. So uh, if listeria welshimeri would be uh, asso associated along with listeria monocyt uh, monocytogenase in an environment, then of course uh, cleaning cycles would be more efficient. And this way there would be lower risk of listeria cross-contamination. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Other audience? Great. Thank you, Baswati. And now we are moving to Kahoot time. Ellie, you are on. Yes. Hopefully, you guys were able to join on. And I will share my screen now so we can continue. Kahoot. So next question. In which year was Phi Tau Sigma founded? So was it 1968, 1953, 1980, or 1989? So Phi Tau Sigma was actually founded by a guy named Guy Livingston at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Yes, it's going to be 1953. And fun fact, I didn't even know the answer to this until I made the trivia. So we're all learning something. Next question. Here's our current leaderboard. Question four. What is the active ingredient in baking soda? Is it going to be sodium chloride, sodium benzoate, sodium bicarbonate, or sodium disulfide? Yes, so that is going to be sodium bicarbonate, which is the leavening agent, which means that it reacts to release carbon dioxide gas and gives the bread and cake pancakes the fluffy texture we know and love today. So with that, we'll take another break with trivia and move on to our next presenter. Thank you, Ellie. Here. So our third presenter, Sumi. She is a second year master in food science at South Dakota State University. And her topic is strong biodegradable and plastic replacing films from agri byproducts. Sumi, would you like to start? Yes. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Sumi Regmi. I'm pursuing Master's of Food Science at South Dakota State University under Dr. Srinivasana Swami. So now let us begin. Plastic is a miracle invention. For decades, we have been thinking we cannot be apart from the conveniences of the plastics. Yes, because it is strong, durable, cheap, and has lightweight. To fulfill the demand of population growth, 9.2 billion metric tons of the plastics had been produced by 2018. Do you know that only 9% of it has been recycled, 12% incinerated, producing harmful gases, and the rest has ended up as the landfills, as we can see here. 
Plastic is non-biodegradable and non-renewable, so it is present everywhere in air, in water, and on land, affecting our ecosystems and killing about 1 million marine species each year. The rivers and the oceans are clogged with plastic waste and the fields are full of plastic garbage. As revealed by a recent study, it is heartbreaking to know the presence of tiny plastic particles called microplastics in the placenta of newborn babies. At present, we are producing 400 million tons of plastic waste each year. Uh, if this continues, there will be more plastics in the ocean than fish by 2050. It is very urgent to sort out this problem and researchers are now interested in alternate biodegradable, non-toxic and sustainable source for food packaging. So my research focuses on the utilization of uh, cellulose from agricultural byproducts like soybean hulls and soybean stalks as the viable option towards the development of food packaging films. I extracted cellulose using alkaline and bleaching treatments. Cellulose is strong, complex, and insoluble in water. So I used um, zinc chloride solution to solubilize it. The addition of calcium ions further strengthened the zinc cellulose network. Later, glycerol is added to improve the flexibility. The solution is now casted on a glass plate and coagulated using ethanol to form the films. The films are characterized for physical and mechanical properties and soil biodegradability. Soy hull and soy stock extract films are transparent and poses high tensile strength compared to commercial low density polyethylene films. Glycerol improved flexibility and elongation of the films. More importantly, films biodegrade within 30 days at 30% soil moisture content. The outcome of this research will be cost-effective and sustainable solution to address plastic pollution and further increase profit for the agricultural industries and the farmers. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sumi. Any questions? Dr. Lauren Jackson? Yes, um, the question I have is um, each type of polymer that's used for packaging has specific uses. Um, I, I'm not sure, have, have you looked at, you know, where, what type of food systems you could use this, you know, biodegradable um, packaging material? Yes. You know, because it has to have some barrier yeah. properties that would, you know, obviously so. Okay, thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, according to the food products, the type of packaging material also varies. So we are also going to our, we are also planning to implement this into the uh, application part. Initially, we are uh, uh, doing in the uh, products like fruits and vegetables, and we are really very excited to uh, perform that experiment from this our films, biodegradable films. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sumi, I have two questions. One is uh, in production of these biodegradable films, there's still a lot of petrochemical uses, right? Uh, all the, the solvents, et cetera, are still uh, being used. Is there a way to reduce the use of these chemicals? Initially, we are using uh, some chemicals, which may be petrochemicals, but we need to still to modify our protocols and all to achieve uh, that goal. Uh, yeah, we could do that uh, if we modify our process and all, but um, uh, yeah, we can also recycle the uh, these chemicals as well. Okay. So, yeah. So recyclability of the solvents yeah. is yeah. feasible. Okay. My second question is, um, the these plastics, these biodegradable plastics, once they are manufactured, I think you are studying the degradability um, uh, after it is exposed to moisture, et cetera. But yes. what about the degradability when, when it is manufactured into a film and it is stored for, let's say, six months or one year? Does it still maintain its uh, physical and barrier properties? Yeah, thank you for the question. Actually, this is a very interesting question. When we store the films in the like uh, uh, room temperature and dry environment, the films will still have the barrier properties and uh, the mechanical properties. Uh, but uh, due to the moisture content of the soil and all, it will degrade. Like uh, as I already said, in thirty percent soil moisture content, it degrades at uh, in thirty within thirty days. So. Uh, yeah, because of the moisture, it, it degrades. 
and yeah thank you but what what about uh, just an environmental not the soil moisture but in an environment in the storage conditions where you know some are coming in here in minnesota humidity will go up under those high humid conditions will it still maintain its properties yeah in the high uh, humidity environment uh, it might not work so uh, we have to maintain the humidity of the uh, store for the storage of the food products using these my uh, these bio biodegradable films Okay. Yeah, I think I answered your question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll have one more question for me, I guess. Um, in terms, of, so you said that you use soy husk and bio, um, those agricultural ingredients. Have you looked into other sources of plant material? Uh, I am currently using the soy hulls and soy biomass uh, in my research, but my other friends are using other biomass products. Uh, so, yeah. Mm, other like corn and all. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Nice for me. Hello. Yeah, I, it was a nice presentation. I want to ask about uh, how much does it cost when it compared to plastic if we prepare these agri-based flips? Actually, we have not studied about the uh, cost of these biodegradable plastics. First, we want to be successful, <laughs> and we, we are trying to uh, implement in the uh, food product itself to increase its self life. So later on, we have to think on it. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Great, thank you, Sumi. And now we are moving to Kahoot time again. Ali, please start. Yes. Share my screen real quick. All right. Next question. During extrusion cooking, food materials are generally subjected to a combination of high shear and low pressure, high shear and high temperature, Low shear and high temperature, or low shear and low temperature? And yes, extrusion cooking technology is applied to the development of instant functional foods. It has an advantage of low cost, sustainability, and versatility for production of a wide variety of food products. So yes, it's going to be our high shear and high temperature. Right back to the leaderboard. Next question. The factor most responsible for making a good ice cream is water content, emulsifying agent, mixing index, or homogenization. Yes, homogenization is a must for any ice cream mix containing fat or oil. The main purpose of homogenization is to achieve that stable emulsion for uniform and creamy dessert. So with that, we will again move on to our next presenter. Thank you, Ali. Yeah. Now, our next presenter is Aditya. He is a master student in dairy manufacturing at South Dakota State University. And his topic is cross-linking enzymes, an opportunity for dairy proteins. Adia, would you like to start? Um, yeah. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. I bet everyone present here in this platform loves processed cheese. I can tell you about myself too. A slice of processed cheese between two slices of bread is one of my favorite and easy to make morning breakfast. 
but do you know the price we buy processed cheese from the market could be reduced and we could potentially enjoy not one but two or more slices in our sandwiches this is because one of the crucial ingredients used in making of processed cheese called rennet casein is costly as it is imported to the united states this is why i am looking for other modified dairy ingredients that can act as substitute but what is this rennet casein let's first start with the word casein it is the major milk protein and its structure you could imagine to be somewhat similar to a fruit kiwi a spherical shape with a hairy exterior called kappa casein the hairy structure does not let the caseins to come closer due to steric repulsion now coming to rennet it is an enzyme which would have a similar function to a knife or a peeler in context with kiwi so it would peel off the hairy outer layer from the casein the remaining protein structure without the kappa casein is called rennet casein so what's the alternative dairy ingredients such as protein concentrates that are prepared by filtering out the milk proteins are manufactured here in the united states therefore these ingredients present a better option to this problem however the casein in these products is intact including kappa casein without removing the hairy kappa casein layer it seems impossible to use them as an ingredient right this is where cross linking enzymes comes into the picture previously in our lab it was found that transglutaminase a cross linking enzyme can cross link the milk proteins in four different ways by creating intermolecular and intramolecular interactions the goal of my project is to use other cross linking enzymes namely tyrosinase and lactase to modify the physical and surface properties of milk proteins to do so i am analyzing physico chemical properties of cross linked proteins and see which of the cross linking enzyme provide best functionality and give us the same good old flavor texture and mouth feel of processed cheese at a reduced price lastly this study will help in reducing dairy industry's reliance on imported rennet casein and increasing the consumption of us manufactured dairy ingredients which will be economically beneficial not only to milk producers and manufacturers but also to the consumers thank you thank you adia any questions hello yeah. i have a question mm -hmm. Uh, uh do you mind sharing the screen once again yeah thank you uh so i wanted to know what is the difference between transglutaminase compared to lactase and tyrosinase that you have used as cross linking enzymes like what is the advantage of using these two instead of transglutaminase um so like there are already studies available which shows that transglutaminase can cross link the milk proteins um like casein and whey proteins whether uh, they are like it can link uh, intermolecular and intramolecular interaction as well but like there are no studies available which shows uh, we can also use this lactase and tyrosinase um uh, so that we can modify this dairy ingredients such as milk protein concentrate and micellar casein concentrate and um they have used this transglutaminase at 7 units per gram of protein like um so i am like we are hypothesizing that lactase and tyrosinase can be used in low quantities up to 5 gram uh, 5 units per gram of milk proteins uh, so are you saying that transglutaminase is expensive that higher quantity be used will cause or is it the sensory properties that create the problem so what is the disadvantage uh, the question is what is the disadvantage of transglutaminase compared to lactase and tyrosinase or what is the advantage of lactase and tyrosinase compared to them so if the quantity quantity is higher will that cause any issues uh, that is my question yeah yeah um it, like uh... these are the things like um uh, I, we are thinking when when we decided this study that because we were we were using transglutaminase at higher quantities but uh, like i'm not saying that these lactase and tyrosinase uh, provide best functionality in terms of transglutaminase we are thinking again for more alternatives which we can use in uh, like to modify the dairy ingredients because transglutaminase is there now we need more ingredients that can provide and there are also some problems with transglutaminase when it is used in uh, like processed cheese product uh, formulation like it shows um, uh, when it is used in micellar casein concentrate it was not giving that um, higher gel strength to the uh, processed cheese okay thank you
Uh, kind of going off that, so you're looking at all these different enzymes and the um, potential. In, uh, my question is, do you see any issues with uh, the enzymes uh, continuing to work after? Because uh, with cheese and or milk proteins in general, they're very sus susceptible to you know uh, exo or uh, outside forces. Do you see any causes of concern? whether we can deactivate the enzymes after application? Um, well, like we, we, are, we are not trying to add uh, these enzymes directly in the cheese, but we, we are trying to modify the like dairy ingredients. Um, as I said, milk protein concentrate and micellar casein concentrate, and then use um, those ingredients in place of rennet casein and see the functionality. I'm not sure how the regulatory goes, like um, like whether we can use it and how the consumer will react to to these um, cross-linking enzymes. But um, they are uh, already present in the nature, and and like we are eating it in one way or another. These cross-linking enzymes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For just a quick question, you know, I you know if 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 these this cross-linking is used in like ripened cheese. Um, do you anticipate, you know, you know, because you know, during the ripening process, the the organisms break down the proteins and you know create flavors. Um, do you anticipate, you know, differences in, you know, a cheddar cheese that was made with this type of protein versus, you know, just regular milk that was ripe um, where you use rennet? Um, yeah, like, uh, so if, uh, that we are thinking to do in future, like we, we are thinking that uh, when um, these will react and they, they will cross link the, that pro protein residues present, uh, sorry, amino acid residues present in the protein. So they might affect the flavor uh, profile as well. But uh, for now, like as uh, ripening takes, um, you know, minimum six, seven months. So uh, I, I, as a master's candidate, I don't have that much time to see the flavor uh, perception, but, but we didn't look at that. But we, we are hypothesizing, yes, that can be a like main area, like how the organoleptic properties of the end product changes by using these enzymes. Thank you. Yeah. Aditya, it wasn't clear to me, I need some clarification, whether you are in a stage of hypothesizing about these enzyme uh, cross-linking or are you actually, have you conducted some uh, testing? Um, for like, as I said, for transglutaminase, yes, we have conducted, um, tested in processed cheese product. Um, we have used in um, this micellar casein, those two ingredients, MPCs and MCCs. But for lacase and tyrosinase, we are hypothesizing that they will also do the like same work as transglutaminase. Okay. So mm -hmm. in that hypothesis, are you planning on using the lacase and tyrosinase ty um, together in treatment of milk, or are you going to be treating the MCCs and whey proteins that are recombined? Yes, MPCs and MCCs, not milk, and then use that ingredient as a formulation in processed cheese product. Very good, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi Aditya, can you hear me? Okay, it was a nice presentation. So, so you will be cross-linking proteins, right? Yes. Using enzyme. So when you cross-link, you will change the structure of proteins definitely, right? Yes. So how about the functionality after cross-linking? Protein yeah. functionality. Yeah, so they like transglutaminase, it improves the functionality. Suppose, for example, when uh, we were using rennet casein in processed cheese manufacturing, it, uh, it like it gives the best, it's the best ingredient that you can use in processed cheese, rennet casein. But again, we don't, uh, uh, again, rennet casein has like that, imp we have to import it and uh, many more problems. So uh, we used MPCs and MCCs, but again, I said we have this kappa casein layer in the protein structure. So when we use um, cross-linking enzymes, they uh, like they cross-link this kappa casein layer. They cro cross-link each each other. Negative charge 
it it goes down and they comes together and it improved the functionality of these ingredients mpcs and mccs and after that like when if you use mpc uh, alone without any treatment without cross linking enzymes they give reduced viscosity in the process cheese when you manufacture process cheese but when we use this uh, transglutaminase treated uh, mpcs like it, it was giving higher firmness uh, as compared to uh, alone mpc okay yeah, Thank you. yeah, that means that means in one line, yes, they in uh, like they enhance the functionality of milk proteins. Okay, yeah. got it. Thanks. Any questions? Well, if no, thank you, Adia. And now we are going to Kahoot time. Ali, please. Move on to question seven. Unless denatured by heat, this protein is soluble even at its electro electro isoelectric point. Sorry, excuse me. But is it going to be casein, pea protein, soy protein, or whey protein? Yes, it's going to be whey. Whey is soluble at its isoelectric point due to its unique amino acid and composition, amino acid composition and protein structure. And I believe the judges are ready for the next question already, or sorry, next presentation already. Yes, thank you, Ali. And our last presenters, Mariam, she's a second year PhD in food science at South Dakota State University. And her topic is reduced starch digestion of polyphenol loaded bread, a new tool to address the type two diabetes mellitus. Mariam, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. A very good afternoon to everyone. And please let me uh, DSA so we can have a way we can pretty much look into the what is would be the impact of the heat on the release or the steady netting on that. Okay, got it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you. And and I think judges have all finished scoring, but before that, Ellie, would you like to announce the winner of the Kahoot? Yes, sure. Let me share my screen really quick. Sorry, guys, we did not get to go through all 20 questions, but that is okay. Those are really great questions that for the presenters and I also had a few of those but yes our winners for trivia are going to be in third place TDB in second we have peas and then in first place we have net so yes congratulations trivia winners uh please put your emails into the chat so I can write it down and I'll also add my email uh, just so we can get in contact after today and you guys will receive your gift cards. But yes, thank you. Thank you, Ellie, and congratulations to the winners. And I'll get back to the competition. All right. So now we are going to announce the winners of CBD Science 2023. This year, the first place will receive $400, the second place will get $200, and the third place will get $100. I would love to introduce our guest of honor, who will announce the winners, Dr. Terry Boyston. Her research interests are food and flavor chemistry. Currently, her research involves effect of incorporation of bifido bacteria into dairy products on microbial viability and quality. Dr. Terry, please unmute yourself and announce the winners. 
to our third, please. All right. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all the participants and thank you to the University of Minnesota Phi Tau Sigma uh, for hosting the competition. Our third place winner is Maswati Chadhuri. I apologize for your name. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Next. Okay. Our second place winner is Sumi Rajmi and congratulations to you. Congratulations, Sumi. Thank you. Our first, please. And our first place winner is Anto Pradeep Raja Charles. Congratulations. Uh, and again, I'm congratulations to all the presenters. Y'all did a great job. Yeah, congratulations to you all. Finally, I would like to thank you. Thank you, sponsors and judges, participants, finalists, and Phi Tau Sigma officer team. We will see you again next year. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Right. Congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Have a good night. You. Have a good night. Fabulous job. Have a great evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Great job, everybody. Thank you. Ali, it was good. Great job, guys. Yeah. It was so great. Shawin, great job. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. You all have to be Bye. proud of yourselves. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, well, only one person from the trivia didn't send their email to me. I don't know who the player TDB was. Okay. But um, I got the other two. So okay. I'm sure they'll contact you or yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. But if they don't, there's not much we can do about it. We can yeah. And Mary, could you like please record, share the recording because it didn't get recorded on my system the whole thing. Okay. So, all right. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.